So great, great, great. Glad to see everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy. I'm here with Maria Robinson, who is the head of the Department of Energy's Grid Deployment Office. I know all of you are wondering how we are going to be able to put all these electric vehicles on the grid, make sure we green our grid, get to 100% electricity by 2035, which is the president's goal. And Maria Robinson has all of the answers and she's a <laughs> fantastic energy nerd on top of it. So Maria, um, you're somewhat new to the office um, yeah. and we're all kind of new to this I I adventure, but you also have been given some significant tools as well as a result of the um, bipartisan infrastructure law, for example, the president's clean energy agenda that's been passed in a couple of years. So I'd love to start, well, first of all, let me just start by having you um, talk about why the grid, from your perspective, is so critical to this clean energy future. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite topics here. And so, I, and one of your favorite topics as well, might I add. So I think that one of the things we think about when we think about cleaning the grid, we often think about either the user end of it, where we're talking about EVs, where we're talking about uh, cleaner appliances, or we're dealing with the generation side of things, where we're thinking about some transition from natural gas over to solar or wind. What often gets lost in the process is talking about what connects these two areas. And that's where the grid comes into play, whether you're talking about transmission, uh, especially high voltage, which goes across long distances where you're delivering some of that great Iowa wind out to the folks who are living in Pennsylvania, or whether you're talking about the distribution level where folks often experience, you know, if the weather is tough, sometimes uh, the distribution grid goes down. And our goal is to make it more resilient so that people aren't losing power and losing access to really important things in their lives. Everybody relies on power for medical purposes or for doing financial transactions. It, it's so key. Just turn it on the lights. Just turn yeah. it on the lights. <laughs> well, so um, we know the grids. I mean, people aren't really thinking about the grid, right? They turn on the lights. They expect the lights to come on. They don't really think about how the power gets to their home. But we also have to, I mean, we've got everybody who, you know, who, who's got a home pretty much a lot. Most people, vast majority of people have connection to electricity, but people don't understand that if we really want to get to 100% clean electricity, we basically have to double the amount of clean energy, clean electrons that are sent across that grid, which basically means doubling the size of the grid in one way or another. That means adding 2000 gigawatts, which is a huge amount to our grid by 2035. How, I mean, when you've got all these tools and everything, how do you think about that in the same breath as you're talking about making sure the grid is safe from these extreme weather events, which by the way, of course, continue to accelerate because we haven't put 100% clean electricity on the grid globally or in the United States. Yeah, we're fighting fires while preventing fires all at the same time over here. So we have a couple of really great tools that Congress gave us through the bipartisan infrastructure law and now, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so we're able now to actually for the first time, the federal government can buy some of the capacity or some of some of the power from these large transmission lines to ensure that there's financing available. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen until further down the line. And if you can't guarantee that someone's going to buy the power from that line, you can't get the financing. And here the federal government through our transmission facilitation program will be able to partake in that for the first time ever. And we're, we're really, really excited uh, about that work. And then we also have some direct grants, which are really great. Uh, and we appreciate everybody. We got a lot of applications for some of those direct grants uh, with our concept papers that were due over the past couple of weeks to figure out how to make the grid both more resilient, but potentially upgrade it at the same time, whether it's through inductoring or through some of what they call gets, which is like these grid enhancing technology and, and, and uh, optimization technologies that are really exciting and cool. So whether we're talking about software or hardware, there are lots of different options for us to, to do the upgrades. Okay. We so do. if we do software and hardware, that suggests that we can enhance the grid we already have, but we also need to add new 
actual transmission lines across the country. And everybody who has followed this or has heard about it knows that there's a whole NIMBY problem with this, not in my backyard. People don't want to see transmission lines over their houses, et cetera. How do you get, how do you double the size of the grid or add significant transmission lines and get around that NIMBY problem? So I think there are a couple different ways to do that. You and I have both at one point in time been educators and we believe in the power of education. And I think a lot of the same people who might not want those lines in their backyard also really want access to clean energy and making sure that they understand that there's a connection between those two things is really important. Um, Congress also gave us another great tool, which is um, some funding to help figure out how we can work with municipalities or counties or states on some of those siting issues so that we are actually working more closely with the communities who would be most affected, which I think is something that we have to do as we're spurring on this massive expansion of transmission and working with offices here that, that continue to do that great community engagement that I know uh, you like to focus on as well. Um, is so important for setting out how we do this in the future. Yeah, and we've also got some money, right, that would allow us, for example, particularly on these distribution lines to bury them, right, to make them more resilient, perhaps even under transmission lines. Isn't there some resiliency money that was in the bipartisan infrastructure law? And if you bury the lines, no one sees them. So it's no big deal, right? I know. And it, some of these options to bury these lines, uh, we've seen lots of great applications come in for people looking for funding for that, um, that. Un, under our uh, Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnerships Program or, or GRIP. So it, it's exciting to see more folks thinking about that, especially as right we see more wildfires, we see more natural disasters happening, and we want to make sure that people stay connected. Yeah, hundred percent, and these hurricanes, et cetera. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, we have a, a huge amount of federal lands, for example, where you know where they're very unpopulated, maybe populated by species, but not by humans. Um, how do we think about planning for the grid? I know you are undertaking a couple of major national studies that will help us to maybe locate transmission in places where you won't have those NIMBY objections or maybe along federal rights of way so that you don't have to, again, worry about getting permission from a private uh, landowner, for example. Say a word about that planning process. Sure, I, we have two major studies going on, actually multiple studies beyond that, but I'll say the National Transmission Planning Study is really looking at further down the road at 2035 as well as 2050 and looking to make some suggestions on different policy changes and different technology deployments that would actually get us there. In the meantime, we're looking at our um, transmission needs study, which looks at much more near term. I know that you and I have talked about a lot of the near term needs because we have these massive interconnection queues uh, where lots of great renewable energy projects are just waiting in line and they just need more of the grid to be built in order for them to come online and, and actually connect. So we're we're looking at both the short, the long term, as well as uh, some things that are happening in the offshore wind side of things uh, and what sort of transmission is necessary there, which is a whole new exciting Talk area. Talk about that. What do you need for transmission offshore? So there's, there's a lot that's necessary, right? You need the transmission that's actually going to be in the water as well as what actually connects back onto land as well as within the land areas, how you connect to some of these large cities where most of the power demand's actually going to be. And that's a lot of planning that has to happen. Uh, a lot of states, including, oop, did I lose you? Nope, nope, I can hear you. Oh, great. A lot of states, including my home state now in Massachusetts, have really ambitious offshore wind goals. So we have to do that sort of planning to make sure that once the offshore wind is actually built, it is connected to where it needs to be. Uh, yeah. I mean, so what do they do? They do they do they bury it in the offshore um, space? Do they put it in a tube and lay it on the floor? 
what is it? Yeah, so it like? is undersea cable for the most part, which is pretty phenomenal and an incredible technology. And there's um, some really great manufacturers across the United States who are starting to get into that space. I know of at least one down in South Carolina that's taking on a lot of contracts uh, related to some of the offshore wind transmission work that we're doing. But uh, we're, we're seeing a really big uptick in transmission related jobs as well ac yes. across the country, which is terribly exciting. Yes, I mean, it is exciting because you, I mean, uh, mostly those are often union jobs, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. That means for people who are watching, if you're interested, you could go in as an apprentice, you could get paid to learn uh, how to become a lineman or a line woman, line person, um, and to be more electricians. To yes, right. we definitely more, need more electricians. electricians. We, need, we need a ton of them, and they pay really well, and you get Ew. great benefits. It's a huge, huge opportunity for people in the in the future. Okay, now you have also started something called building a better grid, a building a better grid initiative. Tell us about what that is. So building a better grid, which is celebrating its one year anniversary or birthday, depending on how you look at it, um, is looking at all of the tools that we have in our tool belt here at the Department of Energy and, and frankly, in some of our other uh, sister agencies as well, um, at all the different ways that we can strengthen, expand, enhance uh, our distribution and transmission system. And that's just so important to raise the profile of this work. Um, I know that we as former elected officials have had our fair share of going to ribbon cuttings. Tell them where you were elected. Sorry, uh, I was uh, in the legislature in Massachusetts, but I'm sure that we've done some ribbon cuttings for you know, solar panels or, or for wind over time. Uh, I think we're going to a, a ribbon cutting for some transmission. And I think we need a lot more of that and to bring some, uh, bring some visibility into all the work that's happening on this grid system. And now, and that's a big part of what this building a better grid initiative is doing too. Yeah. I mean, you've got, uh, I think through that, and you've, you've stood up what five programs uh, At least. Through, through that. And, and I think it's worth like what $15 billion, which is a huge amount. Um, and I think, that we've also been working with states and territories and tribes to be yes. able to make sure that we are um, respecting what is happening on the ground across areas with a lot of uh, particularly uh, public lands and tribal uh, lands. So it's super, um, you know, super important. One of the things that I'm really interested in, Maria, uh, that you know that I'm interested in, but for those who are watching, um, you had mentioned something called reconductoring. And reconductoring yes. basically means adding more capacity, a better transmission line on existing transformers so that you don't have to add new transformers and new lines, but you just make the existing line much more efficient. In fact, if you use the right materials, you can make that old transmission line carry twice as much up to twice as much energy if you use the right materials. And that I, I think is super important in an era where it's difficult to get consensus around building transmission lines. Is that something that building a better grid initiative is also looking at? Absolutely. And by the way, I love the hand motions. I think you should uh, create some sort of dance around reconductoring <laughs> to make it uh, a little bit more popular. Uh, something along those lines. We'll, we'll come back to that. But we'll move it out on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to reconductoring, it's great because we don't have to worry about siting new lines. We don't have to worry about permitting in the same way. We don't have to worry about rights of way or ownership issues that really are problematic sometimes when we're doing something completely new and greenfield uh, with, with some of these projects. And it's great. It's, it is truly a chemical substance. Usually, I believe most, if not all of which is made in the United States as well, um, that you can just apply and it increases the conductivity uh, and, and reactivity of, of your transmission lines up to double, as you mentioned. And, and that's just so huge to be able to take advantage of our existing system and to be able to expand like that. Um, it's something that we are able to fund through some of our programs here and also the loan program office through their 1706 program. It is something uh, Jigger Shaw and I have talked about a lot is figuring out 
how to make reconductoring really worthwhile, especially the advanced stuff that's going to get us that double capacity that we yeah. absolutely need. Super, super important. We love, um, you know, all of our, we have uh, at the Department of Energy, we have 17 national laboratories and they're working on solutions to the biggest problems. And of course, transmission and making sure we are able to get the amount of renewable energy onto our electricity grid that we need to get to these big goals is uh, a part uh, something that they're all looking at as well. One final thing about for in this conversation is that um, Maria and I, she is head of the, the grid deployment office, are working together on rebuilding Puerto Rico's bill grid back better, along with our uh, partners at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association um, Administration. So it's uh, we want to put some of this into practice, and especially because the grid doesn't necessarily have to mean just the electric grid and big transmission, but it can also mean what is known as distributed generation and microgrids. And if you could say just one final word about that as an opportunity, not just for Puerto Rico, but across the country so that we don't always have to re rely on the big transmission lines. No, and I think that adds to the message of resilience when we have all these different microgrids that can connect and disconnect from the overall grid, it increases the ability of especially rural communities to stay connected during some severe weather events or, or other issues that might happen. Um, and certainly we've seen that in Puerto Rico, we've seen it in Florida, we've seen it where places that have that distributed generation and the microgrids are able to stay online during some of these really terrible weather events. Um, and, and we want to see that level of resilience across the entire country. And that's why we're funding all of this great work that's happening here through through our Building a Better Grid uh, related initiative. All right. Well, this is that's there it is. You're 15 minutes in what's happening on the grid. I'm so grateful that Maria Robinson is heading this office because I know she is as impatient as I am to see results. It is a joy to have you on and have this conversation and um, hopefully we'll we'll be back with another guest soon. So thanks everybody for watching. Thanks Maria for joining. Let's go build a better Thank grid. You. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.